So good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, so my name is Mia Philipsen, and I am the co-director of SciLife Lab. And I will moderate this first session of the kickoff between EMBL and SciLife Lab. Um, and we will use the Mentimeter as an interaction tool today. So please go to menti.com and uh, log in using this, uh, the code that you can see here in the upper part of the screen, if you not uh, already have done so. And there will be three questions that you can uh, help us with by responding to them. And I think there will be uh, information in the chat also. And uh, if, yeah, you can just uh, use your phone or your laptop to log in. And this kickoff today will be divided in two different sections. And during this first section, the directors will present their views on this collaboration and announce the uh, memorandum of understanding, followed by some words from the president of the Stockholm University, Astrid Södberg Bidding. Whereafter, we will hear presentations on some of the amazing infrastructures at EMBL and uh, SciLife Lab presented by Professor Jan Elleberg and uh, Joachim Lundberg. Um, and this first, but not the second session, will be recorded and shared on the SciLife Lab YouTube channel. Please uh, use this question and answer function uh, if you have uh, uh, dedicated questions to the speakers and they can answer in writing. After a short break, uh, we will continue with the scientific session where we will listen to invited speakers from both EMBL and SciLife Lab talking under the headings of structural biology, uh, biology in context, and data-driven life science. Um, okay. I um, uh, can see that we have a lot of people from Stockholm joining. And uh, um, from Heidelberg. We will see if this uh, changes during the course of the introduction words that will be given by uh, Professor Oli Kalyonemi, who is the director of SciLife Lab. And following this, uh, we will uh, hear an introduction to EMBL and the new program by the Director General, Professor Edith Hurd, whereafter Oli again will present the SciLife Lab strategies. So uh, uh, please, Oli, go ahead. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Mia, for the uh, introductory statement. So I will be very brief and just well also wish to welcome everybody to this uh, uh, EMBL SciLife Lab MOU kickoff event. And we're absolutely delighted to have this uh, sort of a um, uh, agreement and, and this event but also excited about the opportunity to collaborate with uh, EMBL. And, and uh, we have so much things in common between the two organizations. Uh, so there's a lot to build on. Um, and and uh, we will also make it such that we have certain ideas for the collaboration presented during today. But this is really a, a opportunity for also anybody to Inter, uh, interact and, and give their views on, on what we should really do in practice as part of this uh, collaboration. So welcome everybody, uh, particularly welcome to our EMBL colleagues. It's really good to see you. And it's really good to have this agreement on a, on a European side. So with those uh, little words, I think we are ready to go with uh, Edith Earth, who is the uh, general director of the EMBL and and uh, Edith will present uh, EMBL first, and then I'll come back and have a few words on SciLife Lab. So welcome, Edith, and floor Thank is you. yours, or whatever Thank it is that we are on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so happy, uh, well, first of all, to be with everyone. Um, I'm thrilled that, we're, uh, that we've managed to have this uh, memorandum of understanding. I think, indeed, there is so much that we're going to be able to do together um, in the future with SciLife Lab. Um, we resonate very much. And so I thought I would just use um, my introduction to give you uh, an overview of what EMBL is up to right now and our new program. Um, and hopefully that will stimulate discussions about some of the new actions that we can uh, do together. 
So is this the right format? Are my slides showing in the right format? It's not in a slideshow mode now. And now? No, now it's good. Okay, perfect. So, um, so yeah, so basically a few words uh, about EMBL. Um, I hope that most of the people who have joined uh, the Zoom know about it, but um, this is EMBL in a, in, a, in a slide, in a nutshell. So we're actually Europe's only intergovernmental um, laboratory for life science research. We were founded in 1974, and obviously Sweden is, is one of our important member states. Um, we function across six sites um, that are represented today. I think I saw people from almost all our sites already in the list of uh, participants. So our headquarters in Heidelberg, uh, our site in Hamburg, Grenoble, Hingston, Rome, and Barcelona. Um, we, we deliver on five missions that are shown here. One is excellent basic research. The other is to provide scientific services and infrastructures, and you'll be hearing more about that. Um, also advanced training of all sorts and innovation as well as translation. And last but not least, we try to integrate European life sciences, which I think is a really important role uh, for EMBL too. So we're very international, as you can see, um, many different uh, nationalities from all over the world. Um, and across the six sites that I already mentioned to you, we have almost 1,800 people working. Each of the sites um, has a slightly different uh, focus. Uh, Amble EBI, that many of you are familiar with, uh, bioinformatics, uh, and Grenoble and Hamburg for structural biology. Uh, Barcelona, our most recent site for tissue biology and disease modeling. Rome uh, focuses on epigenetics and neurobiology. And last but not least, Heidelberg, which you know was the, 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 the very first site and which spans many different things. And you'll be hearing a bit more about some of our new services there, um, including the imaging center. So these are the five missions that we have to deliver to our member states. Our research um, is incredibly collaborative. I think that's one thing that EMBL is really, really uh, known for. And uh, this MOU is, is going to be another example of that. Our advanced training at, at many different levels, courses and conferences, training PhD students, postdocs. Uh, we have international programs that have been used as a model um, all over Europe. And we have a new program that I'll mention later uh, to train engineers. In terms of service provision, um, for just a few examples here, Emble EBI data resources, there are 80 million daily requests um, by the end of 2019. So this really is uh, one of our, our major um, service uh, delivery sites, but also fantastic research. Um, we also deliver on structural biology and imaging. So we have more than 4,300 annual user visits to our structural biology and imaging services in, in the period of 2015 to 2019. Um, and we had more than 1,100 visits to our core facilities in just 2019. In terms of innovation and new technologies, EMBL has always been about developing new technologies um, and uh, just in one year, we had 34 inventions. I think last year we had five or six new spin-offs um, and the imaging center, which you'll be hearing more about opens this year. And indeed, I mentioned our 27 member states, but also our partnerships and our local alliances. And I'll come to that in a minute because of course, Sweden is part of one of our most successful partnerships, the Nordic partnership. Um, and we're constantly trying to facilitate European scientific networks. EMBL was instrumental in bringing about Eurobioimaging, uh, Instruct. We're also part of a new um, AI European initiative called ELLIS. So I just want to one slide about the pandemic because um, I think this is on all our minds and, and just to show that in fact, the pandemic illustrates how EMBL is useful and, and what we're for. We delivered on all our missions during this, uh, this last year and a half. Um, we continue to, to provide research and so relevant obviously to um, SARS-CoV-2 and trying to rise up to some of the challenges our collaborators had to, to sort of try and allow the, the, the best technologies to be used during this period. Despite the lockdowns, we were able to remain functional and our labs were, were all um, open uh, minimally for a few weeks, but now more fully. Um, we try to run our experimental services, including the synchrotrons and the core facilities right the way through the pandemic. And this has already delivered on many different fronts um, 
in terms of uh, discoveries and publications. Um, and maybe just you know, a couple of examples. Uh, for example, the, um, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine uh, was being tested at our Hamburg Beamline facility run by Embel. Um, and we also have a number of, or we've had to turn virtual as has everyone, but that's meant that we've delivered on our conference and co our courses and conferences in a way um, that we never imagined we would do so fast. But in fact, this has been incredibly useful to accelerate our capacity to reach out to even more people around the world. Um, and all of our data scientists, of course, have been working flat out. And this has been extremely useful in the context of the pandemic, which has shown us not only how important science is, but how important basic research and research infra infrastructures are to provide the tools that we need to fight such a crisis. Um, and it's only thanks to uh, organizations like EMBL and the basic research that has been done, not just at EMBL, but around the world, that the tools to fight this crisis have been developed, including, for example, cryo-EM, but also the genomics tools. And I think that's really important. The pandemic has, has illustrated how critical it is to have collaborative approaches and to have open science. The virus had no frontiers and science should not have any frontiers either. And Embel has really ep epitomized this. And in particular, I want to give you an example of um, the links with Sweden and with Scilife Lab because Embel EBI set up the COVID-19 data portal as soon as the pandemic broke out. Um, and this has been integrated um, into the national context in Sweden and led to the Swedish COVID-19 data portal operated by Scilife Lab data center. So, so this is um, just one example, I think, of how infrastructures such as ours together can really try and um, work uh, for, for uh, the world and against this, this kind of crisis. Um, I just want a couple of other uh, examples of links that we have. There are many, but in terms of structural biology, uh, there was a very nice study between uh, Chris Lowe's group in Embel Heimberg and scientists at Karolinska in in Institute uh, to develop synthetic antibodies or nanobodies that bind to SARS-CoV-2 surface proteins. Embel is also extremely supportive in the work for ESS and MAX4, and I think uh, Oli will say a few more words about this later. And in terms of our research collaborations, um, I think it, there are many, many uh, uh, successful examples already. Just in the year 2019 to 2020, there were almost 100 joint publications between EMBL and Swedish scientists. And there have been 67 grants uh, since 2017, many of them still ongoing. And of course, EMBL and SciLife Lab have a collaboration in, context, in the context of CryoEM and the CryoNet Symposia, the latest of which is called New Directions in Cryo-EM Research. So many, many links, and I really hope that um, we will be able to, to nurture this even more uh, thanks to the MOU. And of course, I really want to highlight the Nordic Partnership for Molecular Medicine, which started back in 2007 and has been a huge success. And these partnerships are very important for EMBL and being able to reach out to our member states in a very privileged way and to act as a sort of glue to make sure that um, you know, people can work together, um, leverage funding together. And the molecular infection medicine Sweden, um, Swedish node, MIMS, is uh, one of the, uh, of the four members of this partnership. And basically MIMS um, is extremely relevant to the new program that EMBL has put together and to the MOU that we're about to sign with SciLife Lab. So we're very um, happy and excited about the prospect of this because obviously um, MIMS in the areas of research that it covers um, will be hugely important uh, looking forwards. And there have already been a lot of successes at MIMS. I won't go through all of them, the group leaders who've been hired, uh, the Nordforsk uh, Research Infrastructure Hub funding. There's also an initiative to have an EMBL uh, Nordic postdoc program, NORPOD, um, and, I just, and last but not least, of course, I should mention uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, who, um, as we all know, won the Nobel Prize together with Jennifer Dudner for her work on uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. And this is just a quote that she had given, which is that it was the environment within the Nordic EMBL partnership um, that was instrumental in helping her to achieve these results. So it's been a success, and we hope that in the future more to come. And this is just a couple of slides to tell you about the next program that EMBL has set up. We'll start in 2022. It's called Molecules to Ecosystems. And our goal 
is really to try and understand life in context together with all of our member states um, and Sweden in particular, and to try to provide key mechanistic insights that could also provide potential solutions to some of the challenges that um, our world is facing. And these of course include loss of biodiversity, climate change, pollution, the spread of antimicrobial resistance, issues of food security, emergent pathogens such as the one that we've just uh, had to deal with. And, and in fact, this program was uh, elaborated on before the pandemic hit. So I guess Emble was kind of uh, getting ready without knowing. Um, and the big issue is to really try to do basic research that can deliver solutions for human and planetary health. So um, it's built on three big pillars. One is to try and have this bold scientific vision. Um, Amble has to come up with bold visions every five years. Um, and this time it is about trying to understand life in context at the molecular level, not just in the lab, but reaching out to where life really happens uh, in populations, communities, uh, in changing environments. And to try and make sure that we harness um, our research to more innovation and translation, because we believe that this is what will provide the foundations for some of the economic recovery that we need after the pandemic and the future of economic growth. This type of program hopes to deliver that with our member states. Um, advanced training and tailored services will be part of what we would like to provide. And I just want to show you how we've built this up. The program, which has now been endorsed by our 27 member states, um, is built on our solid foundations of molecular biology, structural biology, neurobiology, genome biology, et cetera. Um, and we've tried to introduce some new themes which allow us to sort of reach out into this new area of understanding life in context. And um, because of our nine year turnover rule and because we're very dynamic as an organization, constantly hiring new people and, 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 and the people who are here are constantly moving on, it means that we can evolve like this. And so we have a 44% turnover of group and team leaders in any five year period. So these themes can naturally happen. And in fact, we're already hiring in some of them. And this is, I'm not going to go through them in detail. You're going to hear about some of this in today's presentations. I'm really happy about that. And we've already discussed actually with Ollie and colleagues that maybe we should have another workshop dedicated on some of the, these themes as well. So one of the more, the more sort of uh, uh, extraordinary themes that Emble is not so well known for is called planetary biology, where here we really seek to reach out um, away from our comfort zone to try and understand molecular, cellular and organismal uh, life at the population level, both on land and in the sea, um, and how life responds to environmental change. Some of the other areas, um, such as human ecosystems, infection biology, microbial ecosystems, data sciences, theory, you're going to be hearing talks today that touch on these. Um, and we would love to be able to join forces with um, scientists at SciLife Lab and deliver on all of these fronts. So um, just a few examples before I finish on the new sorts of services that we would like to provide as well, which I think is very relevant if we want to try and be as synergistic and complementary as possible. Obviously, Emble EBI will provide all sorts of new data resources, um, including new data portals on the types of data that we will be generating this new program. Um, uh, we will also be providing new types of structural biology facilities um, at our Hamburg, Grenoble, Hamburg, uh, sorry, Heidelberg and EBI sites. Um, and this goes from the preparation of samples right through to um, the uh, delivery of the data on our platforms, either the Beamlines or our CryoEM platforms, as well as analyzing the data and making sense of it um, using uh, AI types of approaches. And the new imaging center, as I said, will be opening this year. Uh, Jan will be presenting this and it's about multi-scale imaging, the first of its kind in the world. And we really hope that this will be a great use to SciLife Lab and, and Sweden. So um, uh, this is a snapshot of one of the areas of scientific service we would like to deliver in planetary biology. In, in particular, we have an expedition called TREK, which um, will be both mobile laboratories and um, vessels in the sea. Tara Ocean, some of you uh, probably have heard of Tara, was the inspiration for this. And it will be a coastline um, exploration project where we will team up with our um, partners in different marine stations. Some of them have already been defined, others will be defined to try to bring our um, expertise um, and to try and you know, deliver both 
um, the equipment that would be needed, but also some of the training and also some of the outreach activities, so reaching out to the public at the same time. So this is, um, I hope, uh, uh, an exciting new venture where SciLife Lab, I hope, would be interested in joining courses and, and we'd be happy to discuss this. And as I said, maybe we should have another workshop in the future that touches on this. And the training um, approaches we're going to have will be based on what we already do, but embracing the new themes. So our pre-doc course, also our postdocs, um, and we would like to have postdocs that are actually um, in these new areas. And so with, you know, bridging to other disciplines such as ecology, mathematics, epidemiology, uh, our courses and conferences as well. And last but not least, we will have a sabbatical program to try and bring um, top scientists or scientists who have the experience from all over Europe who would like to come and spend some time with us to, to build up on, in some of these areas. I mentioned that we have a new training program called ARISE. This is for technology de developers to become research infrastructure scientists. Um, and this is something that I think with SciLife Lab would be extremely important as well and look forward to discussing this. The calls are already open for this. So the, um, the idea is that this program should usher in a new era of life sciences. Um, I won't go through this. I think I've, I've probably made the point. We want um, to enable new research, new discovery, but also access to new technologies, new services and new infrastructures. And we want to do this um, with, together with our member states and to align with national priorities. And, and I think Sweden is a perfect example where this has happened very naturally. So um, this is my last slide. I'm very happy that we have this memorandum of understanding with SciLife Lab. I think it will bring new research and service collaborations um, in many different areas, new training activities, and also joint applications for Horizon Europe funding because our program is very much aligned with the, um, the missions of Horizon Europe. Uh, and I hope that indeed we will come out with many ideas uh, for collaborations, but also for scientific workshops and outreach activities. And with that, I thank you. And um, we'll hand over back to Oli. Thank you very much. And I do want to just say thank you to those colleagues from both EMBL and SciLife Lab who put this together. Um, Oli and all of his colleagues in SciLife Lab and from our side, um, John Marioni and my other EMBL colleagues. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. So thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Edith. Uh, that was wonderful. So uh, let me do a, a quick roundabout of SciLife Lab now. Um, so I hope you see this okay. So this is the actual uh, uh, MOU now. Uh, but I wanted to kind of a, give a little bit of an update on SciLife Lab for those of you who do not know SciLife Lab that well. Uh, many people are from the SciLife Lab community, so obviously for you this may be all well known. So uh, let me first of all uh, uh, put this in perspective that obviously uh, Sweden has been an EMBL founding member since 1974 and continues to be so. And this is sort of a, a foundation for our uh, interaction here. Uh, and as Edith was saying, the, uh, there are many important activities between EMBL and Sweden, one is the Nordic Embel uh, Molecular Medicine Partnership, where MIMS is the partner. And then uh, this new MOU is in no way uh, uh, sort of a uh, making the other agreements uh, less important, more so. It's synergistic in many ways. So we have tentatively considered that we uh, could particularly discuss infrastructure in this collaboration. The planetary biology is an exciting theme. Structural biology is obviously uh, was mentioned also in edit talks and the new data driven life science that I will uh, be talking about slightly, but I should say that these areas are preliminary we haven't really set them in stone in any any way so they are open for your um, community impact as well. So uh, a few quick words on SciLife Lab so we are a much younger organization than EMBL established about 10 years ago as a first a strategic research collaboration between the four universities in Stockholm and Uppsala. But then in 2014, we had an assignment from the government of becoming a national infrastructure. And this is now driving the, the essence of, uh, essence of uh, SciLife Lab. And this has now led to a situation where SciLife Lab has a national user base. We have a strong uh, impact on the science uh, 
uh, produced at Scilab Lab and by our uh, infrastructure users. And we have locations all across the country uh, today. We just had our 10 year anniversary last year. Uh, we also created a strategy for the next 10 years uh, with just many, many links with, with EMBL, as I say, short, uh, in a short while. And then this year has been the launch of this data-driven life science program. So today, Scilife Lab sits on three pillars in a way, infrastructure, research, and data. And uh, as I said, we have a major campus in, in Stockholm, in, in Solna, another long-term initiative in Uppsala. But this agreement with Scilife Lab is really should be put into the national context. We're actually formally opening national nodes we already have had activities in different cities as well, but we are formally opening uh, Scilife Lab national nodes uh, later this year in, in uh, other, other cities in, in, uh, in, in Sweden. This is the 10 year strategy that, uh, well, I kind of a uh, one, one figure of the uh, 10 year strategy, which is using the infrastructure as a, oops, infrastructure as a, as a base here, uh, research, communities, capabilities, data-driven life science, translation, collaborations, and, and scientific excellence. And like Edith said, this is, there's a lot of similarities here, obviously. EMBL is, is strong on infrastructure aspects and has a specific uh, goal in this sense. Uh, EMBL is obviously mostly about fundamental research in molecular biology. Uh, then there is the translational innovation aspects that, that was discussed. The, the coordination of uh, life science research in Europe, like we try to coordinate it within uh, Sweden. And then obviously the training aspect, which is really, really strong in, in EMBL, and we would like to uh, make it uh, equally strong in, in uh, Sweden as well. So obviously there's a lot of uh, uh, strategy that, that is aligned. We, uh, you could say that, of, of course, there's been Jan Ellenberg has been our chair of our international advisory board. So obviously he and many others have influenced this, but I think there's also the underlying thinking that is aligned, which I find really uh, uh, thrilling and amazing. Uh, as I said, three main aspects of Scilife Lab now going uh, forwards from here, national infrastructure, research aspects, and data-driven life science. This involves quite a large community we have about 500 technology experts who maintain these services, 1,500 users each year, about 3,000 projects. Uh, then the internal research community is about 1,000 scientists. And now this new program will add about 500 data scientists and data-driven research in life science. So I'll quickly go through these three topics on a, on a, on a uh, forward. So we just renewed our infrastructure platform structure. We have 10 different platforms consisting of individual units in it. I will not have time to go through this again, but this is, as you see from the letters here, these facilities are located all across uh, uh, Sweden. Uh, we have lots of quantitative data to, to support the fact that this is really uh, serving a national function, the distribution of users matches the distribution of science, life science in Sweden. So this is fully national user base. Most users have been quite satisfied. And they also, the ones who have used Scilife Lab services, uh, publish particularly high impact uh, uh, journals. So this is a more uh, sort of a closer look at the 2020 statistics. So most of our users are from the academia uh, with some uh, increasing fraction from healthcare. And then all major universities in Sweden are represented, as well as some 10% international uh, uh, users as, as, as well. Uh, we'll not be able to go through uh, all of the various infrastructures, so for, uh, I will just piggyback on a couple of things. Cryo-EM was already mentioned that I think structural biology is also a, a perfect opportunity for collaborations with EMBL, which has a long-term uh, tradition in structural biology. Our uh, latest uh, joint platform is called uh, Spatial and Single Cell Biology. And this mir uh, mirrors and marries the single cell expertise and spatial biology expertise. And you will hear uh, uh, later about this, but this platform of uh, spatial omics is also a nice example on how we try to move beyond 
sub, um, kind of supporting and, and providing individual core facilities for the user community, but to create a comprehensive capability, uh, which is in this case, spatial omics with a number of different technologies that allow you to profile uh, uh, biology in the tissue context or in the morphology uh, spatial uh, uh, context. So we are very excited about this one. And you will hear from Joachim Lundberg, who has had a major success in, in developing the spatial transcriptomics technology that was last year uh, nominated as the me major method of the, of the year. And exactly in the same way as Edith was showing, we have also played at SciLife Lab a major role during the pandemic. So we've had the national infrastructure repurposed to, to serve uh, the, the pandemic research with, uh, through a, a support from the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. We have supported biobanks and developed diagnostics, particularly in the early days when the healthcare sector was not really prepared to uh, handle the load. Uh, we have had uh, COAVE supported national research program on COVID-19 and uh, as already indicated, the COVID-19 data portal was developed for Sweden in the SciLife Lab context supported by uh, VR as well. And all of these activities have now led to government actually allocating funding for SciLife Lab for the next four years under the title Laboratory Preparedness for Future Pandemics. So we are now considering how we can better line up these capabilities as a part of a Swedish preparedness for the future uh, pandemics or the next waves for the current uh, pandemics. And as uh, uh, Edith already said, the COVID-19 portal shows a great example of how we can not only integrate the Swedish science, but then have the Swedish science linked up and integrated seamlessly to the EBI-based uh, European and global uh, databases. And we think that this should be a model for the future in many other areas of science as well. Quickly about the research community, we have a, 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 a about 1,000 papers each year published, high impact papers. Last year, there were a lot about COVID-19. And similarly, as EMB, there's a focus on young scientists. So we have uh, a, a fellows community that are uh, uh, provided support to start their research group at SciLife Lab. And this community of talented scientists have already been extremely successful in raising, for instance, ERC uh, grants. We've considered uh, several areas and they're reflected in the seminar today on potential collaboration with EMBL, planetary biology. Maybe we should have a workshop on this already in the fall of 2021. The integrated structural biology with the cryo-EM capabilities and other uh, uh, capabilities at SciLab, but also linking up to Max4 and ESS in Sweden. And then the data-driven life science, where, which is the Knut and Alice Wallenberg uh, Foundation donation, which links very much to EBI and the data science in, in the EMBL. And this, just to, uh, to finish up a couple of words on this major new uh, program that is supported uh, by COAVE. So, so uh, this is about data-driven life science, which we think is the future. And, and with our, uh, with, similarly, as with EMBL, there are programs starting elsewhere in the world just about this topic. So we think we are extremely timely together with EMBL in getting this uh, activity uh, started. We've set up a, a, a seven uh, a sort of a project steps uh, that we want to promote here, national framework, scientific excellence training and, and so forth. And this is really a collaboration between 11 different partners supported by the Knud and Alice Wallenberg Foundation uh, over 12 years. So we're really, really excited about getting this going. One major part of this is again, the recruitment of young group leaders. Over the years, there will be 39 fellows being recruited to this program. This is also the specific aspect that it will combine data scientist community and the life science community, because there is another Wallenberg funded program on data science. So we look forward to, to joining the, these uh, two programs together. And I think this very much uh, mirrors and links up with the EMBL uh, interest in this domain as well. So that was a quick roundup about, about the uh, uh, program. And, and again, I remind again that this should be put in context. We are still debating and we want your feedback today about what this collaboration 
should be all about. And, and I will stop now here. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you, uh, Oli and Edith, for presenting these exciting visions of how to enable and promote the most important as well as excellent science. So now it's time for the announcement of the Memorandum of Understanding, and I will soon leave the word, word again to Edith and Oli, um, and we will document this for the future by taking a photograph. Uh, and then we will hear some words from the president of Stockholm University, Astrid and by bidding. But we have, of course, already identified a lot of synergies between EMBL and Scilab Lab, and we would love to get your input, as Oli said. Um, what do you think that this collaboration will accomplish? Please fill in this at menti.com. I can see that you've already started. Uh, great. Um, you can continue doing so, but now I will leave the word uh, again to Edith. Thank you very much, Mia. Um, and so now comes the more formal moment uh, of the day, our signature. If we were all together, we'd have our plume uh, pens, uh, but instead we're going to do this by Zoom, which is, um, which is great too. And so first of all, thank you, um, dear Oli, dear, dear colleagues. I'm, I'm really delighted that we're doing this together. Um, and I feel that um, the workshop surrounding this MOU is particularly meaningful and timely um, in the context of what's happening to the world and EMBL's new program that I just presented to you. I feel that uh, now more than ever, Europe really needs its excellent science and infrastructures to come together and to lead the way out of the sort of health emergency that we're living and prepare for potential new challenges in human and environmental health. So ultimately with the development of novel green technologies, um, advanced data sciences as Oli, um, just outlined as well for SciLife Lab and theoretical approaches, and by training a new generation of interdisciplinary scientists, we hope that EMBL, together with SciLife Lab, will be able to really contribute to the economic recovery that Europe needs. And so building on this ambitious goal, and through the signing of our MOU, EMBL looks forward to increasing and deepening the collaborative links with SciLife Lab, the Swedish research landscape, and, and MIMS in particular. So we're very well aligned in terms of our forward-looking strategic institutional priorities, as well as the various um, research collaborations between our institutes that already exist. Um, and in particular, in the area of data-driven science and scientific services, together with structural biology and single cell approaches, I feel that there's already plenty for us to do. So through our MOU, I'm confident that we will develop these further and in the context of the European Union science funding scheme will pave the way for a new era of discoveries, awareness and solutions for the benefit of our societies. I hope that we will be able to organize another similar event in the fall um, and hopefully it will be in person. And so that way I, I really look forward to um, meeting up with many of you and in the meantime to today's discussions and to understanding how we can strengthen our uh, activities and synergize even more. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you, Edith, so much. And, and let me just reiterate, I mean, you said almost everything uh, so beautifully already. So let me just be brief. And I actually alluded to many things in my presentation as to how there are many surfaces for our interaction. We are absolutely delighted to have this MOU now uh, uh, signed. It has sort of incubated over the last uh, year or two. And, and uh, it's it's great to have this now uh, signed. And uh, But this is really the the, the uh, end of the beginning of the uh, sort of a uh, opportunity now for us to start interacting in practice. So this is now up to the research community to take it forward and, and uh, sort of a make it uh, work. And I'm absolutely uh, convinced that there's all sorts of uh, exciting science that will come out of it. So, so thank you uh, to EMBL for all the help in getting this uh, organized to your team and uh, also to our team in, in, in uh, working uh, with EMBL in that sense. This has been really great, uh, but it will be even better in the future. So thank you. And now if I were to have the pen, I would sign this thing uh, as well. But, but uh, now, as you see, this is 
formalized already and and uh, it's it's a formal document in that sense so so uh thank you with that and and i think uh, i could now pass on the word uh, directly to to uh, uh President of the Stockholm University, uh, uh, Astrid Söderberg Reading, will say a few words, uh, which I, I guess uh, also emphasize the point that this is not an agreement between Stockholm and, and Heidelberg or, or, or uh, any, any particular site in, in Silat Lab. This is an agreement for the whole Sweden as well. So Astrid. Thank you, Oli, and many thanks for inviting me to be part of the SciLife Lab Amble kickoff and signing ceremony. Uh, as chair uh, of the Swedish Association for Higher Education Institutions, I today represent not only Stockholm University, nor the four SciLife Lab host universities, but the entire community of universities in Sweden engaged in life sciences. The MOU that is signed today is indeed not only an internal matter for SciLife Lab, but an Amble Sweden agreement that I'm really enthusiastic about and which I believe will be of great importance for Swedish life sciences. I'm also delighted to hear that Amble director Edith Hurd is excited about collaboration opportunities in Sweden. So are we as Swedish universities. Sweden highly values Amble and its important role in the European collaboration in life sciences. As an example, the already mentioned European Bioinformatics Institute, EMBL EBI, referred to by Edith Heard, could once again be mentioned, which is of great importance for all Swedish universities, promoting open availability of fair life science data. Personally, I'm deeply engaged in the advancement of open science, including fair open data, where Sweden has been lagging behind for a long time. It is therefore all the more important to cooperate on the European level for fair open data. Another great advantage is that EMBL is promoting basic science, the importance of which is too often neglected. I'm convinced that this collaboration may help to strengthen fundamental research within Swedish life sciences, which is of utmost importance for the future. We cannot only focus on solving challenges, as we are not yet aware of tomorrow's new challenges. The rapid development of the vaccines that now offer hope in the COVID-19 crisis are, as we were just reminded of and are well aware of, the result of several years of basic research. At the same time, the ongoing global challenge of the pandemics, which we are still struggling with, has indeed highlighted the great importance of life sciences and shown how we cannot afford to neglect their importance to tackle societal and health problems for the future. In light of all these developments, the SciLife Lab AMBL agreement is very timely, and it also offers several opportunities for concrete action, such as the topics that will be highlighted in today's webinar program, infrastructure, research collaboration in, for example, structure, biology, planetary biology, or data-driven life science. These topics reflect very well the ambitions of the scientific community, but they also meet the goals in the Swedish government's life science strategy. Whereas they may, may often be a tension between governmental strategies for science and researcher-led scientific developments, they here rather converge, which offers many possibilities for collaboration and synergies. Today, there are major developments underway across all these areas in Sweden, such that, as the integrated structural biology capabilities, the SciLife Lab Cryo-EM, together with Max4 and ESS, as well as the new data-driven life science program, so generously founded by the KAV, KAV Foundation, which offers new and exciting possibilities for life sciences in Sweden. Within the framework of, on one hand, the EMBL program, Molecules to Ecosystems for 2022 to 2026, and on the other, the SciLap Lab Roadmap 2020 to 2030, I'm convinced that the new MOU will indeed contribute to, as the title of the webinar suggests, building new important collaborative links for the future. Thank you. So thank you, uh, thank you very much, Astrid, for those kind and uh, supportive words. So here we have the result uh, of the Menti 
um, investigation of what you have, your expectations for this joint collaboration. So um, you want thematic workshops to spur joint research collaborations and to spur joint infra tech development and for joint funding, exchange visits for young researchers and for, for infrastructure service scientists. Oh yeah, it all sounds extremely exciting, I think. Um, and now I want to present Professor Jan Elleberg at the EMBL, EMBL Heidelberg. Um, Jan is also sharing the International Advisory Board of Scilife Lab, as you already heard. And we'll today talk about imaging at all scales at EMBL. So please, Jan. Thank you very much, Mia. And uh, it's really a pleasure to start the session on, on infrastructure. As, as you said, I've been privileged to follow the development of SciLife Lab over the last 10 years, and I'm really excited about the amount of synergies that has grown over the so exciting times ahead. I will go ahead and share my screen. Which I hope you can see now. Is this working fine? Yes, it looks. Yes, we can see it. Excellent. OK, so I want to talk about uh, a new infrastructure at EMBL that should enable imaging across scales. And to motivate this, I want to very briefly draw on the research in my group to illustrate uh, what cross-scale imaging can do with a few vignettes uh, of research applications. So as a very brief introduction, I think image data is increasingly driving life sciences these days. After the revolutions of biochemistry, molecular biology, and omics technologies, we now have imaging technologies that really allow us to put the molecular components of living systems back together in space and time. And so the major two innovations that happened were both in light and electron microscopy, where the resolution now has reached a level that the structure or the individual function of molecules can be directly visualized in Z2 in living systems. So that means microscopes have become the tools of molecular biologists rather than of <clears throat> anatomists or morphologists. And so that means we now have the ability to really correlate many different imaging technologies and integrate and analyze their data jointly. And in this way, really bridge many scales of resolution in space and time in living systems. So I want to very briefly give one example for what that could concretely mean from our own research, which has to do with what is the dynamic network that drives human cell division. Now, many core functions of life are driven by large molecular networks that all the time feed back on each other and change their composition and their function in space and time. And so that's very challenging to map these networks and understand them dynamically. And so we've taken imaging approaches to do that by using microscopy in an absolutely quantitative way, where you can determine at every point inside the cell how many molecules of a particular protein are acting at that moment uh, in, in that space. And so doing such imaging during one of the most basic functions of life, the cell division process, in a systematic way for many different proteins that we homozygously knocked into human cell lines, we could reconstruct a computational model of the protein network that drives human cell division. And so this network can be visualized either as a spatial entity, which you see at the top of the slide, or as an interaction entity, which you see at the bottom, and again is resolved dynamically. You can see how the interactions are changing, the network structure is changing, but also where the components is interacting is changing at every moment of the biological process. Now, data like that is very rich and it can be provided in a virtual reality form. So researchers can now go into a virtual laboratory, pick the protein components that they are interested in from a virtual lab shelf, give them a particular color, throw them into the cell that they want to visualize them in, and then really step inside the cell and animate it in space and time. And also probe different positions inside the cell with the virtual pipette man to ask how many of a particular protein are where and when working inside the cell. So this is very rich for exploration. 
but I want to just give one example of how useful it is to have such absolutely quantitative data about cell division. And so here we now zoom in on one particular protein machine, the condensin protein complex, whose function is to structure mitotic chromosomes. And so the data set we provided in this atlas allowed us to get absolute numbers. And we could ask how many condensins associate with the genome when genome segregation is prepared. And so the answer for this was that there is about 175,000 of these complexes on the entire genome of a human cell that is about to divide. So that sounds like a very huge number, but if you break it down to one chromosome and DNA molecule, it's actually just a few more than a thousand protein complexes that have to orchestrate the restructuring of the chromosome to be able to be segregated. And so having that absolute quantitation available allowed us to calculate that actually the compaction of the DNA into a mitotic chromosome has to be achieved by forming loops of DNA of a particular size. And this model predicted that the DNA loops would have a size of around 100 kilobases to be able to gather together the DNA into the compact classical X-shaped mitotic chromosome structure. So that quantitative prediction was just a prediction for a number of years because we did not have the technology to actually directly visualize these DNA loops inside cells directly. And so recently we've been able to overcome this bottleneck by again using imaging technologies to now tile DNA specific probes along the length of a chromosome and resolve with a resolution of only 10 kilobases the individual loops inside the chromosomal DNA molecule under native conditions. And so this kind of data now allows us to see in a snapshot fashion how the DNA fiber is changed when these individuals are formed. And so rather than just having statistical proximity maps, we now can see the process of DNA looping and the size of these loops forming in individual cells by microscopy. So with this little vignette, I want to stop the examples uh, I give to motivate why imaging is useful and just very briefly summarize that. I've showed you how three different imaging technologies can allow us to zoom in into a dynamic protein network, resolve that in space and time, see how it drives mitosis. Then we can couple that to super resolution microscopy to look at the protein complexes that do the individual functions, and then in fact, bring it to the nanoscale to map the 3D folding of the chromosomal DNA to understand how it's restructured to achieve one of the core functions, cell division. So this required already three different imaging technologies, and we were privileged to have access to all these te technologies to carry out these experiments. But for many, many researchers, in Europe and in member states, this accessibility of these cutting edge research imaging technologies is rather limited. And so that is a bottleneck that we decided to address uh, with the new EMEA Imaging Center as a new infrastructure on the Heidelberg headquarters site. And you can see that the building that we planned a few years ago is now actually a reality. We already moved the first instruments and the service teams into this building that you can see on the right of the slide. And the mission of this building now really is to provide open access to scientists outside EMBL to the latest light and electron microscopy technologies directly from the research and technology development of the leading groups in the world, provide high-end tailored project support by, by postdoc level scientists and engineers that are fully dedicated to support the visiting scientists, and also in challenging the technologies constantly with new life science problems promote innovation and also effective commercialization of new technologies for the community at large. In addition, and this was referred to already earlier, the center will provide advanced training both for the users that want to do research with imaging technologies, but also for research infrastructure staff from other sites that would like to offer similar services. So the focus here is really to bring together structure and function and to bring together highest end electron microscopy to determine structure in situ with highest end light microscopy to probe function in situ and marry these technologies via a variety of correlative approaches. So I won't have time to go through all the different technologies on offer in the imaging center, but because we want to link these two levels, there's a strong emphasis on the light microscopy side on super resolution microscopy 
both technologies developed at EMBL as well as technologies that are now just becoming available commercially, such as the barium influx technology. And so these light microscopy methods will allow whole tissue imaging, as you can see on the right with an entire brain column reconstructed by three photon microscopy or drilling down to the dynamics of individual protein complexes, as you can see on the left with the reconstruction of the nuclear pore. Now, after doing that, looking at the tissue in an overview, then zooming in on the right protein complexes in the right functional state, we want to enable researchers to also determine the structure. So to move these samples into cryo-electron microscopy, find again the same cell, the same subcellular structure that is carrying out the function and then doing structure determination with the highest end electron microscopes. And so that allows to in situ determine protein structure to the atomic level that actually then highlights the atomic changes and conformational changes that gave rise to the physiological function. So that's a quite ambitious vision for what kind of research we want to support in the community. That means we have to help people through the whole cycle of carrying out an image-driven research project from the sample preparation via the image acquisition on a variety of research-grade microscopes and the full blown data analysis that often now uses AI approaches to interpret the images and derive structure and functional parameters from them. So as I said, we have completed the construction of the building rather than architect's sketches. I can now show you the building at daytime and nighttime. Currently already running first pilot user projects from EMBM member states. And if you're interested in having one of those, please contact us. And the building will formally open for business in September. And we will follow immediately with a completely open call for user projects for scientists to come to Heidelberg and use these technologies and be supported in their research. And so with that, I just have one acknowledgement slide for the research done in my group. And of course, all colleagues that have helped with the Imaging Center and to make that vision a reality are also acknowledged very gratefully uh, in this presentation. So with this, I will stop sharing. And in case there are questions, I will be happy to take them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Jan, for an absolutely beautiful presentation. Uh, so please post your questions in this question and answer function if you have any questions to Jan. And remember that the open call opens in October 2021 if you want to, if you want to get, uh, get your science into this uh, using these methods. Um, and then I would like to give uh, the word to Professor Joachim Lundeberg at SciLife Lab and at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, who will talk about spatial biology and, as Uli mentioned, developed the method of the year 2020 according to Nature Methods. So please, Joachim. Thank you. Uh, very exciting event, I must say. Uh, so do you see the presenter view or the correct view right now? It's the correct view. Okay, perfect. Okay, so thank you so much for, for giving me the chance to talk about spatial biology. Um, I'd say, we'll say a few words about the service platform and then really to explain how that really originated in a way. Um, so I have five topics uh, that I will cover. Uh, first, the platform, then talk a little bit more about spatial result transatomics, and actually also talk about the research environment that we have at Silaf Lab that fostered the way that we actually develop our platforms. And then I'll have a vignette of something where we kind of describe how we use our infrastructure to obtain uh, biological knowledge and then a summary. So I'm um, part of the spatial and single cell biology platform at Salaf Lab, but it's really headed by Professor Matti, uh, Mats Nilsson. Um, and this platform is really to provide service for advanced space analysis of uh, biomolecules in situ, in tissue sections simply. Uh, and this is really a, a wide variety of different technologies that we try to put into this fairly recent um, platform. So the, the data coming out of that is, is still to see, but, but I will give uh, some examples within the vignette. So these different platforms, what are they really providing? Well, they are providing some analysis into different biomolecules. 
Um, so we look into RNA, we look into the protein, and we look into DNA and also small molecules. And this is really what the different platforms are providing. The readouts for these different methods are really, it's mostly imaging, but the spatial transatomics also provides uh, sequencing as a readout. And we think that these different platforms are complementary, as some of these are super unbiased, while others are targeted. And the degree of targeting depends very much on the technology. And from the user perspective, you really should come in with the fresh frozen samples and you could use any of those. Or you, you, uh, if you have a fixed sample, some of these platforms are less useful. And then for all of these, you will also obtain different spatial resolutions of your biomolecules. So in, all in all, you have a, a, a smorgasbord, as we say in Swedish, uh, of different technologies that you could use to address your biological problem. So I'm going to then take a small deeper dive into to the RNA world, which I am uh, myself involved in. And I'm going to show you two of these uh, technologies that we have you know, that we're using as a platform. And these are then uh, coined as spatially resolved transcriptomics, which is a field that has really exploded in the recent years. And this is just an overview of the evolution and revolution in the field of spatial resolved transcriptomics. So this field started in the early 80s by designing a probe to query your favorite transcript of interest or gene of interest in tissue section. And this is then, uh, as you look on this slide, it's, it's a green round circle. And this type of technology where you design probes has really expanded over the years uh, with increasing number of probes that you could analyze at the same time. In the late 90s, uh, laser capture micro dissection was, was another option to look into spatial context where you use laser capture to isolate different histological regions of a tissue. Uh, early 2010s, you had the first method that really did in situ sequencing, really to determine the sequence of a transcript. This is what we call ISS. And this is actually one of the platforms uh, that, uh, uh, that is part of the Silaf Lab was developed at Silaf Lab by Mats Nielsen. And also this kind of in situ sequencing has, has uh, evolved over the years and more and more targets can be sequenced in the tissue section by uh, similar type of technologies. Um, the last kind of technology is really the spatial transcriptomics that was then published in, in uh, 2016. That was the first method that you really didn't need to design probes to query your RNA, you capture the entire transcriptome. And that facilitated different types of analysis to explore and using data-driven approaches. And this type of technology has, during the most two recent years, have had many uh, similar technologies to address the complete transcriptome. And we were super happy to see, as Oli mentioned, that, that the spatially resolved transcriptomic technologies was really the method of the year. And on the cover, it's actually just the spatial transcriptomics technology where you have a barcoding system on the surface of a glass surface. Uh, and on top of that, you put your tissue section and you image that. And then you treat the RNA down to the barcoded surface. And by capturing the entire transcriptome, you do, could do data-driven analysis of the tissue section. Now we exemplify that actually. So how, how can we, I mean, these were two main developments within the research and now has um, uh, matured and come into a, to an offering. But what was really the, the, what made these developments possible? It's really uh, organic growth of a research project where we develop technology, re realizing that, well, we're providing so much more data. So we designed the first versions of bioinformatics and that in itself led to completely new questions that could be addressed by computational biology. And then finally, we tried to take these technologies into biological applications. So I would say this is shared for many of the, of the technologies within the uh, spatial uh, and single cell um, platform. Another important, which is very nice in the context of, of this MOU, is that networking is really driving much of the science that we do. Um, this is just exemplifies for my own uh, laboratory that we have a big, big outreach to make the best of the tools that we have developed in collaborative efforts. 
And this is a good starting point, I think, for the MOU. So um, I just would like to do a vignette uh, to really explain and how we explore the spatial and single cell biology. Um, and, and we, and one of those components is the spatial transcriptomics technology that I just mentioned. We would take tissue sections, uh, we image those tissue sections, we bark with the RNA and we use DNA sequencing to provide uh, an unbiased view of the entire tissue. Uh, and that provides uh, many opportunities to develop the computational and biomatic tools. So this is a, a, a truly a spatial technology. But what we try to do in many of the projects that are ongoing at Scilab Lab is that we try to couple spatial knowledge to temporal things. Uh, and we see that in organ development, and I'll give an example of that shortly. We see this as a very useful tool for tumor growth. And we also involved in quite a bit of ne neurodegenerative disease as disease is, is really this, the spatial oddities, I would say, is, is a feature of the disease. And then, and obviously, the tumor heterogeneity, which is usually a clone tree kind of analysis, is a proxy of time as well. So um, we have really three different uh, projects or, or common topics, which is cancer, neurological disease, and human cell atlas. Um, and I think human cell atlas is really something that is, is shared uh, over borders to a large extent. And this is really why, where my vignette comes in, because at Salaf Lab, we, have, we are focusing on a large program to describe developmental processes in uh, human brain, human lung, and human heart. And this is, has been funded by the Alain Passion and Kovi, the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, for some time now. So I will just give a short vignette of how we try to address uh, developing human lung. And this is a nice collaboration with uh, many different technologies, but also a very excellent scientist at Stockholm University, Karinska and KTH. So this is really what we start out with this, in a project like this, is that we take the single cell platform and use that to generate a lot, a first draft of all the genes being present during human development. And we focus in our program on the first trimester and, and this is just exemplifying a temporal view of all the samples that we are gathering for the lung samples. Uh, this is starting from week five to week uh, 14. And for each time point, we, we do a single cell uh, analysis. And that generates more than 160,000 single cells. And what we do by that is, is to really to look for gene expression similarities. So cells that share the same gene, similar, gene expression similarity are clustered together. And many times these then represents different cell types. So this is a, a accumulated view of the entire development of the, of between week four and week 12. So what's nice with this temporal aspect is that we actually could see which clusters appear early in development and which uh, clusters appear late in the development. So we get the dynamic feeling of the uh, development of the lung. So what we do then is, is to take each and every cluster and try to understand what kind of cell types those are. And this is really what that type of analysis is generating, which is really a first manual annotation of all the clusters. So we have identified some 30 clusters representing some 30 potential cell types. And, and it's made hard to see, but if we go into the legend here, we see that many of these cell types are of mesenchymal origin, which is more or less expected for the lung. Um, but this is also pointing to a dilemma with the single cell type of technologies, which is that the annotation for the mesenchymal is very, very poor. So the, we have a lot of classes that are less and kind of like. So then we come into the next imperfective, which is the spatial transcriptomics that I just mentioned, is based on unbiased analysis of the transcriptome. So we put our developing lungs from six weeks to 12 weeks. And as you could actually appreciate how the lung grows. So we are then performing the analysis. And many times we could actually do it on the same individual as we have two lungs. Uh, to match the single cell data with the spatial data. So this 
then opens up for the possibility of using two different infrastructures to obtain some spatial annotation of the clusters. Uh, and this is obviously very small, but this is really the 30 different clusters that are identified and their spatial location. And this involves a new technology and new bioinformatic strategies to position these cell types, these clusters onto cell types. And it's hard to appreciate, but you can actually see that these are two adjacent sections and the robustness of this column is, is very, very good. So I have one, one example how, how useful this annotation is for this project. So as I mentioned, the mesenchymal clusters are many and poorly annotated at single cell level. But if we just look on these uh, five different mesenchymal clusters, we could actually uh, give, provide much more deeper insight of what they really represent. So you could actually see that this cluster zero is presented uh, at the distant part of the lung, while this cluster is, is further into the lung. And then you have some regional uh, clusters position here and so forth. And this is kind of indicating that we get very high uh, degree of information of these developing clusters in time, in, in, in uh, space. But we also have then is, is the temporal aspect uh, where we could actually see this is the reverse region, this uh, uh, view of it. This is the weeks six to week 12. You could actually see how these different clusters uh, are represented at the different time. And then we couple then the third platform, which is in situ sequencing, because we would like to get a single cell resolution and we design probes to query our cell types that we have identified by single cell and spatial transatomics. And here again, we could add, add with a defined set of 150 or so genes, find cell types by using different probabilistic approaches to, to score these. So we could actually uh, move on and we get a very nice view of this. So um, obviously um, this is just a vignette of how we work with the platforms, but this opens a, a many different opportunities to think about the next steps. And this brings me back to, to areas of collaboration. Well, uh, I think we have a lot in common in, as a service provider of technology, but I see also a lot of research activities can proceed within the computational biology. And I have a very two short uh, examples where, where I think we could find mutual interest. One is the, uh, how can we visualize organ, uh, organs using molecular data? And we did a pilot a year ago where we tried to describe the mouse brain only based on gene expression, not taking advantage of the information that is already present in uh, well-used Allen Brown, Brown atlases. So in this case, we did spatial transatomics of consecutive sections of the mouse brain. And each of these small classes represent regions that have a shared gene expression profile. So what we can do then is to, to actually paint the brain just purely based on gene expression using no histology or no molecular markers to define this organ. And obviously this is a canonical structure and it's easy to do this kind of experiments, but we would really like to do in the future is to do this for more organ uh, wide purposes of the things that are within the human cell atlas. Another way that we think that we could see service uh, being interested is really on the experimental side when we increase the modalities on a single tissue section, but also on the bioinformatics side. So, just to summarize, I think spatial biology uh, are now being made a service at Silat Lab, and I see a lot of co uh, commonalities with the EMBL uh, work. I hope I've proven that geography really matters, and, and we see a future that will use this type of technologies much more, and that we could uh, use data-driven approaches to annotate tissues is extremely exciting. And I see again that we could find commonalities in bioinformatics and uh, tools, but also in the way that we could analyze our tissue sections in a more comprehensive way using multiple different technologies. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, Joachim, for yet another beautiful presentation. And uh, now it is time for a short break.
And please use this break to uh, respond to the last Menti question that you will see shortly. And to remember to rejoin for the scientific session that starts at 10.30. Yeah, so this last Menti question is, which research areas do you see as most prioritized for joint efforts? Okay, see you in 14 minutes.